One part of the expansion hierarchy, right? which could be different in different theories. In phi four theory, it will be lambda. So the other G K of R doesn't contain any uh, lambda. Okay. The point is, uh, if we become clear in the example, that we have this set of parameters G one to G L. Okay. Now the point is, when you do perturbation expansion, we pick certain terms from here and then do part of expansion. So when I say that it contains one part of the expansion parameter, okay, it means that one part of those parameters out of this in which you are doing part of expansion. So those are a subset of all the parameters that we have. Is that clear? Yeah? So GK of R for other parameters might be zero. Okay. So I wrote GK is GK of R plus I think capital GK or GR epsilon, right? This was the formal group. So the difference between these two, the idea is difference between these two should contain at least one part of the expansion. Right? That's that's all this means, right? Which in the in the case of five pi four theory will mean the lambda parameter. But I think when, when I do the pi four theory, it will become clear exactly how this arises. Any other questions? If you are doing uh, specific theory in higher dimension, can we still use the dimension regularity? Yes, you can still do dimension regularity. Where we will define d equal to say, suppose we are doing with six dimension, six dimension, yeah. six minus epsilon. Exactly. Okay. Uh, the general formula that I have given is valid for all d. Right. So if you want to use it in higher dimension, in six dimension, you just have to take the d goes to six. Then. Yeah, so in general, dimensional regularity can be used for any dimension of quantum physics. Right? Other questions? Okay, so today what I'll do is I'll work out explicitly the one loop renormalization of 5 4 theory. So here I think it will make clear the various abstract notions that we introduced last time. I'll use a slightly different language, but I'll try to make contact with what we did yesterday and what I'm the language that I've been I'll use. Okay. So we start with the axle integral d d x. I'll call this coupling constant G instead of lambda. Okay, this was the action for pi four theory. But we have to keep in mind from now on that these parameters A and G at uh, M and G could be infinite. Right? Because the way we'll take the limit epsilon goes to zero is that I'll have to express m as a function of some renormalized parameter in epsilon, g as a function of some renormalized parameter gr and epsilon. mr and gr will be kept fixed. They will be finite parameters. In the epsilon goes to zero limit, at fixed mr and gr, m and g could diverge. Okay, so this is what you have to keep in mind. Yes. This mr and gr, they are different from what you have No, they are different. Physical quantities are what are, what are directly calculated in the S matrix. Right? So when you calculate S matrix, right? S matrix will be a function of M and G, they will also be functions of M R and G R. But the S matrix is directly observable. Right? You can work out what M R and G R are in terms of S matrix. But that depends on the Romerson scheme as well. So the MRs and GRs, you shouldn't think of this as physical parameters. Their values can change depending on how you choose to renormalize. S matrix is what is given to us. And that's what we measure directly. So MR squared? Margin? 
square. Inverse square will not be the physical mass. Will not be no. Okay, in general, Lamar square will not be the physical mass. So at some point, Some input. Uh, which calculate means uh, number. So we need to specify what. Yes. So what the way we will do is that I'll calculate physical mass as the location of the two-point function, the pole, location of the pole in the two-point function. Okay. That will be some function of MR and GR. Okay. That will be one input. That function is what is we know. Okay. Then we'll calculate some other uh, uh, S matrix, the four-point scattering at some fixed energy. There will again be some function of MR and GR. Okay. We'll. Uh, take that data, then we'll determine MR and GR in terms of those parameters, uh, those observables, right? So that's the way we'll determine MR and GR, and that's what we'll take as input. Okay? But this functional relationship between the physical observables and MR and GR, okay, as you'll see, they can depend on the Riemannian scheme. So MR and GR could be changed, okay, if you use a different Riemannian scheme without changing the theory. That's right, exactly. Yeah, one and lambda. Okay. If you are happy with lambda, let's put a lambda. Okay. So G is the collection of all parameters. Okay, lambda and M are the parameters of pipe theory. Okay? Yeah. So now before we go on, let's do some dimensional analysis because it will be a little useful. So in D dimension, let's try to calculate the mass dimension of pi. So you have to calculate the mass dimensions. And in the unit that you are working on, where you have said h bar and c equal to 1, x, which has the dimension of length, this has mass dimension minus 1. Okay, so this is the mass dimension. Is this familiar? Right? Length has mass dimension minus 1. So x has mass dimension minus 1. The action, of course, has to have mass dimension 0. Right? Because it appears in that to the IS. So let's look at this term over here. So you get 0 equal to minus d, minus d, because there are d x's. Then we have derivatives. Okay, derivatives means x in the denominator. So that's plus 2, plus 2 times the mass dimension of 5. Okay? This is a symbol for mass dimension. So this gives you the mass dimension of 5 as d minus 2 by 2, which is 4 minus epsilon by 2, which is, which is 2 minus epsilon by 2. There is 4 minus epsilon minus 2. So that's 1 minus epsilon by 2. Is this okay? First, then, let's look at this term. So 0 is minus d, which is coming from here. Then the mass dimension of this parameter m plus 2 times mass dimension of pi. So this tells us that the mass dimension of m is 2 is mass dimension of pi minus d by 2. So this is 1 minus epsilon by 2. But this is minus pi plus d by 2. So minus 1 minus epsilon by 2 plus 4 minus epsilon by 2, that's 1. Yeah. Minus 1 plus epsilon by 2, right? that cancels the minus epsilon by 2 over here. So 2 minus 1, which is 1. So m has mass dimension 1. Okay, which means that m really has a dimension of mass. Okay, it's not a physical mass, but at least it has a dimension of mass. And finally, we have to find the dimension of lambda. So there you get 0 and minus d plus dimension of lambda 
plus phi 4, so 4 times the dimension of phi. So this gives us that the dimension of lambda is b minus 4 times the dimension of phi, which is 4 minus epsilon, and then 4 times 1 minus epsilon by 2, which is epsilon. So we see that in four dimensions, epsilon is zero. Okay, so this coupling constant lambda is dimensionless, so it makes sense to carry out a perturbation expansion in parts of lambda. But in general d dimension, this parameter lambda doesn't have dimension zero, it has dimension epsilon. And so to carry out a systematic clear series expansion, normally we use dimensionless parameters. So for this, it will be useful to introduce a new way of labeling this lambda. So we are not changing the theory, but we will take lambda, instead of taking lambda, we will replace lambda by lambda mu to the epsilon, where mu is some mass parameter, some mass parameter, which has nothing to do with the m that you have here or anything else, mu is some finite mass parameter. So instead of Calling the coupling constant lambda, we'll call it lambda mu to the epsilon. Then mu to the epsilon has dimension epsilon, so lambda will have dimension zero. Sir, this yes. uh, mu does uh, introduce some scale in the Lagrangian? Mu introduces scale in Lagrangian, but of course the final result should be independent of that scale. Right? The physical result should depend on the uh, value of mu, but at this stage mu is introducing some kind of scale in the Lagrangian. Is this clear? So let me write it here again. So what we'll do is that instead of taking the action that is written there, I'll take the action to be slightly different, integral d4x times minus half del mu phi del mu phi minus half m square phi square minus lambda by 4 factorial mu to the epsilon phi to the <coughs> Okay, the final result of course will be independent of mu once you take the epsilon goes to zero then. At one loop that will be what means this actually will make no difference. Okay, whether you put the mu to the epsilon or not, it makes no difference. At higher loops you will see that, well, if you do higher loops you will see that there is a uh, it, it, it's convenient to have this mu built in. This makes it clear that all the expansions that we're carrying out are in terms of dimensionless parameters. Okay, even when epsilon is not zero. <coughs> okay, at one loop we will not really interpret this problem because we'll take epsilon goes to zero limit at the end anyway. So mu will not think of as a parameter. Okay, the mu is just some fixed mass that is given. Okay, and it's clear that the final result should be independent of mu. So the parameters of the theory will still be considered as this a and lambda. Okay, the g's that I introduced last time, okay, there will be two g's, g1 we can think of as m and g2 is lambda. Okay, and the perturbation expansion is in powers of g2. Okay, in fact, we will see that it's in terms of powers of renormalized g2. Here in d dimension. In the measure d4x. Oh, d, yes, thank you. d4 minus x. Okay, so now we are going to make the change of variables that we described last time. Okay, but we will use a slightly defined notation. I will try to explain the relationship between these two notations. Yes. You are doing this dimension analysis for arbitrary dimension or some inferior number? No, arbitrary dimension. Because ultimately you want to take epsilon to be an arbitrary constant. Right? And take epsilon goes to zero. So this dimension analysis is an arbitrary dimension. So of course when d is fractional, this is a formal analysis. Right? But it's just that it's useful to do this analysis here and introduce this parameter so that when we 
at the intermediate state of the calculation when you haven't taken epsilon goes to zero limit, you will still have an expansion in powers of dimension less parameter. Which redefinition? Because you could have always absorbed this mu to the extra inside lambda. Because the theory really depends on this combination, right? So you are not really introducing a new parameter. Right? It's just a, so you think of mu as a fixed parameter and lambda as variable. Right? But if you want to vary mu, right, that's equivalent to a variation of lambda. Right? So that's the reason why it doesn't depend on mu and lambda separately. Right? But in this combination. Is this point clear? Right? Because as written the Lagrangian, it always depends on this combination, right? So if you multiply mu by 2 and divide lambda by 2 to the epsilon, right, it's exactly the same theory. Right? So you, you don't really have a new parameter that you have introduced to the theory. Any other question? Okay, so first. Then let me write down the relationship between phi and phi r. So if you remember, we take made a general postulate that the original fields are some kij times renormalized fields. In this case, there is only one field, phi. Right? So there is only a multiplicative renormalization, okay? just a multiplicative constant. That multiplicative constant is what I am going to call z tilde phi gr lambda r mar epsilon to the power half times phi. Okay. So this quantity is what I had called k gr epsilon epsilon. So k or kij, we introduce this kij, here of course i and j are all one, okay, just running over one field. So but this is that k, okay, but I have just invented a name for it. Is the square root of something called z tilde phi. Is this clear? Okay. So m in the notation that I used yesterday, okay, I would have written fm, m as some function fm of lambda mr lambda epsilon, right? Okay, these are our renormalized parameters and epsilon. This refers to the first function, okay, fm. But today I label this as zm lambda mr epsilon times mr. Okay, you just think of this as ZM, we can define as FM divided by phi. And that's all. It's just I'm just inventing a new kind of name. Okay, we'll see that this, this way of labeling is a, is a little more convenient, and that's why I've done this. And similarly, G, which would have been FG of MR, sorry, lambda. I'm going to call this as z lambda of, let me, I'm using lambda, m r lambda, right? So let me use that order, m r lambda r epsilon. So z lambda, m r lambda r epsilon times lambda. Okay, this is my definition of z lambda. And now let me make more precise the uh, statement that I made yesterday. 
So what I said yesterday is that to leading order, phi should be phi i. And our expansion parameter in this uh, theory is lambda. Right? Earlier lambda was the expansion parameter, I'm now going to use lambda, the normalized parameter is the expansion parameter. So to the leading order in lambda, phi and phi r should be the same. Okay? So z tilde phi should have the structure that is one plus order lambda. Okay, because in the lambda r goes to zero limit, the leading order result should be phi equal to phi r. Okay, so this is what I meant by saying that the differences from the original fields, original coupling constants should be one order, should have one extra part of the coupling constant, of the expansion parameter, okay, which in this case is lambda r. Similarly, m and m r should be equal to leading order. So ZM again should be one plus order lambda. ZM should be one plus order lambda. And similarly Z lambda should be one plus order lambda. Here you see that to leading order again lambda should be equal to lambda. Okay. So the correction should be of order lambda R square. Because in the lambda goes to zero limit, lambda should not re reduce to lambda. Okay, so z lambda should be one plus order lambda, so that the correction is of order lambda as well. <coughs> is this clear? So lambda will become lambda plus order lambda as well. That is because you have taken out the lambda. Pardon? That is because you have taken out the lambda. Okay, so why if, if the correction to z lambda is of order lambda? Then the correction of lambda should be of order lambda. Pardon? Yes. So these functions will all be dimensionless because M R and lambda R will take to be dimensionless. Sorry, this this will take to be dimension of mass, and this will take to be dimensionless, right? And since A has dimension of mass and lambda has dimension is dimensionless, okay, these functions should all be dimensionless. Yes. And then there should be uh, one plus order. Like yeah. Plus if there are more than one coupling, then there should be more than one variable here. Mm -hmm. right? So it will be. It can be either the first order in the first coupling or the second order, first order in the second coupling. Only one. Well, some kind. In some cases, that correction may vanish to first order in both couplings. In which case, it will be higher order. Right? But it should be at least the first part of one of the couplings. Right? Because when all the both the coupling expansion parameters are going to zero. Then z should go to one. Is this clear? Then we'll call this higher order correction, right? See, you are doing a perturbation expansion. So we are expanding in powers of lambda. Right? So if you if there is a correction of order lambda square in this. We'll call this a higher order correction. That's the definition of the order of the correction, right? Is that okay? Is this a lambda or is the expansion parameter? That's why you have taken the corrections to be linear. That, that's the leading term, right? It may happen that some corrections may vanish. Right? Order lambda. In which case it will start at the next order. Right? So when I say that it's order lambda, it doesn't mean that. Order lambda corrections are necessarily non zero. Any other question? So let's now take the original action and write in terms of these. So the original action now becomes integral d dx minus half z tilde phi.
I divide it. The fact that I have taken a square root is purely a matter of convention, right? I could have just taken defined this to be the like tilde phi. Okay, it's the shouldn't worry too much about this. So now what I'm going to do is that I am going to divide this action into two parts. One where we replace all the nets by one. So minus half del mu phi r del mu phi r minus half. So this is the, the the whole thing. Of course, the original action. This is this has is written in a form where it looks like the original action, but the fields and parameters replaced by the renormalized fields and renormalized parameters. All the extra things that involves the that that is proportional to the difference between the z's and the ones. That's in the second term. And if you remember yesterday, I said that this is what is called the counter term. Yeah, I, I just divided the action into two parts. This part and this part okay, will start doing perturbation expansion with this, okay, because this part of the action ha has a leading contribution, right? Because these are all already these contain at least one part of lambda, right? By assumption. So these, in some sense, are small. We'll do perturbation expansion. In, we'll treat this perturbative thing, okay, and with this, we'll start doing perturbation. And the idea is that whatever divergence you encountered in trying to do perturbation expansion with this will cancel by adjusting these coefficients. And that's the way we'll determine our z tildes and z. Because we have not said so far about what these are. Right? We have just made an arbitrary division of the fields into of the action into two parts. Right? So far the z's are completely arbitrary. And all I have done is that I have chosen some constant. And I have redefined our fields, phi in terms of phi r's, m's in terms of m r's, g, uh, lambda in terms of lambda, and divided the action into two parts. Can you explain again why the second part is like small? Small. Okay, it's small in the sense that if you compare each term in the first line with the corresponding term in the second line, you will see that this has an extra power of lambda, right? Because this is z tilde phi minus one, right? Already has lambda. R. Here is zm squared z tilde phi. Right? This product will again be to leading order is one. Right? The correction is of order lambda. Right? So again, this difference is of order lambda, R, and similarly, this difference is lambda R squared. Yeah, there is already a lambda, R, so this is lambda R squared. So these terms are small. 
small compared to the first line. Right? That's why we will treat this part of it. But we are keeping terms of order lambda in the first line also, right? That is true. Yes. So the point is that you have to compare uh, like, uh, terms of similar type, right? Because otherwise uh, there may be hidden lambdas, right? Because typically when you have amplitudes with more phi's, you also automatically introduce more lambdas. Right? So if there are if there are different kinds of terms, right, then it's hard to compare. Okay. In this case, I mean, this is a simple enough story that, so that it is possible to do this comparison. Okay. And what you do here is that you make all terms in the first line have the same power of lambda by I think you have to what you have to do that you have to absorb this scale this phi up by some beta okay. and adjust the power of beta so that all of these have the same power of lambda. Okay, you can easily do this, right? Because these two don't have powers of lambda. This has i r to the four, right? This has a power of lambda. So basically, by scaling, you can write this as a one over lambda times a something which is independent of lambda. And in that language, it will become clear that these terms are all higher order, all mm -hmm. larger than these terms. All I'm saying is that if you scale, if you absorb some power of lambda inside phi, right? You can make all of these terms have the same power of lambda. Yeah, and then you can compare them. Okay, but in this case, you don't really need to do this. You just compare term by term. Okay, like terms, here always you have one extra power of lambda compared to that. Okay, any other question? Okay, so now let's start calculating this. So we start with two point function of the normal estimates. These are the tilde here did not school at okay, We are looking at moment of space. And while doing this calculation, We'll think of the functional integral as being done over phi r. It doesn't really matter if you do it over phi r or phi because that's just the overall constant which you factor out anyway. Okay. So think of the functional integral as being done over phi r. So you just use the Feynman rules for phi r. Okay. And in deriving the Feynman rules, we think of this as the unperturbed part okay. and everything else as part of it. Okay. This quadratic part we treat as unperturbed part. Okay, that's the leading order. We'll calculate the propagator with this part. And everything else, okay, this one, of course, we are already, already treating perturbatively. But everything on the second line will treat as a perturbation because it already has parts of lambda. This is here. So this will get contribution. So we want to calculate up to order lambda. So let's see what we have to do. So this is the leading order contribution. Okay. No interaction term. Then there is a contribution like this. And then there is a new kind of contribution. This is the term that is counter coming from the counter term. You see that this line, which you are now treating perturbatively, has Two powers of phi. Okay, this has two powers of phi. This has two powers of phi. Okay. Typically, if there's an interaction term containing n powers of phi, you get a vortex with n phi's coming out. Okay. This is an interaction term with two powers of phi. Okay. Whatever we have done so far, we have we would have included this in the uh, kinetic term, right? We would have included it in the definition of propagator. Okay. But because this is already a power of lambda. We would like to treat this perturbatively. Okay, that's why you have to think, think of this as contributing to the two-point vortex, and that's what this represents. Is it clear? Okay. So let's now get down to doing this calculation. So this is P1, P2, 
So this one gives you 2 pi to the d delta t e1 plus e2 and then minus i over e1 square plus m r square. Okay. Yes, this is not the first two terms of the counter term. The last one is a, is a four, fourth part. So that, you see that this term doesn't contribute because this is already of order lambda r square, right? Okay, whereas we are trying to calculate to order lambda r. Okay? So this is a leading order. This doesn't have any power of lambda. This will have a power of lambda because this is coming from here. Okay? And this has a power of lambda because this z minus 1, these are already are expected to have powers of lambda. Okay, this, this is this is this term. Let's look at this term. Plus, okay, I'll first write the 2 pi to the d delta d e1 plus p2. The vortex gives you minus i lambda r over 4 factorial due to the epsilon. Then okay, that's i times this vortex over here. If this is L, we have integral d d l over 2 pi to the d times minus i over l square plus m square. Thank you. Okay, so propagator has been calculated with m r square. Right? Because this is this is the term that is calculated in the problem. And then you have to put the commentary factor in. Okay? So how much is that? Yes, two external propagators also. Thank you. So that's I over minus Q1 square minus Qmar square. I over minus Q1 square minus Qmar square. And the commutatory factor, let's write it here. The first one can go in four, four ways, right? Four parts, four things coming out of this. So four, and then the second one can go in three ways. The three that are left over, four times three. And then the two that are left over have to basically contact with each other. So this one is divergent. That's what we are trying to remove, right? Integral d d l over l square plus m r square. Is that okay? Is okay? Then we have this one plus again two external propagators minus i over q1. Okay, first of all, the this two pi the overall momentum conservation of course is here two pi to the d delta d q1 plus q2. Then minus i over q1 square plus m square. And then you have to use this vortex, right? I times this vortex. So I, what will be the contribution from here? So first let's say minus half, let tilde phi minus one. Then for this, Minus, okay. This one, del mu phi r minus i p1 mu and minus i p2 mu. 
right? Because this is acting on the phi carrying momentum Q1, this is acting on the phi carrying momentum P2. Okay. Yeah, so basically these are the minuses of each other. Okay, so this gives P square, Q1 square. What about this one? Square. Right, and then there's no derivative, so this is what you have, and then the combinatorial factor two, because that phi square, right? Both have two powers of phi r, so the first line can connect to either this one or this one, right? Or here in this one or this one, right? So the combinatorial factor is two. This clear? Okay? Because two things coming up, first line can connect to any of the two, second line connects to the other one. Now you see that some parts are common, which we don't have to worry. See this part, okay. First of all, this is not fi infinite anymore. This is perfectly finite, right? So you don't have to worry about this. <coughs> this has a possible divergence. That has a possible divergence because these are allowed to be infinite, right? In fact, we want to make them infinite to cancel those divergences. So these we have to keep. And you have, the idea is that you have to add the, uh, adjust the z tilde files and z ends such that the divergences are cancelled. Okay. So let's take out the common factor. Okay. The first line of this, this one, and here these are just common factors. Right? So you don't have to worry about these. So let's take them out. So what we want to demand is that i times this 2 cancels that 2. So i times uh, minus i times z is the phi minus 1 times q1 square minus plus z m square z is the phi minus 1 m r square times 2. Sorry, 2 has gone. Two has gone. Two has gone. So this is the contribution from the second term. Plus, this is 4 times 3 and there is a 4 factorial. Okay, so that's half. So minus i lambda r over 4 factorial. Sorry, lambda r over 2. Okay, 4 times 3 root 4 factorial gives you 2. Times integral d d l over 2 pi to the d minus i or l square plus m r square lambda lambda mu to the epsilon this will be finite So we'll have to adjust these constants to make this thing finite. So you have to evaluate this and see what you get. Is this clear? So this choice of finite is actually renovating P or this choice of what is the what yes. you want to make the so the point is you'll see that there'll be ambiguity, right? Of course, when you say this is called finite, right? That means that we can determine the infinite parts of these z tilde's and z's. But not the finite piece, right? You always have a choice of adding some finite piece, right? And that is the different denomination scale. 
Yeah, but that just corresponds to redefinition of the car, the finite redefinition of the coupling constant. So at the end, it doesn't really make a difference. So let's calculate this. See here, this is written in the uh, Lorentzian portion, uh, right? So this is dl0 and uh, dl1, dl2, dl3, right? So we make a change of variables. l0 is equal to i l4 or i l d, whatever it is. Right? You can think of l1 to l d minus 1 and then the last one is l d. l0 to i l d. So then dl0 will become i times dl d. So that i and minus i will cancel each other and become plus. Okay. So this then I can write as integral d d a d. A d stands for Euclidean. Okay. So a d means Euclidean. Over 2 pi to the d. 1 over a d square. Okay, L square just means L1 square plus L2 square up to, up to L D square, right? All positive. Okay, because I have just changed L0 to I times L. So this one we have given the general formula for. Okay, you have to look up your notes. So this I think is given by 1 over 4 pi to the power d by 2. And then some ratios are law functions. I think the general formula was that this is gamma of alpha minus d by 2 over gamma d by 2. Sorry, gamma alpha. But alpha is this power over here. Okay, if this alpha is the power of this. Okay, so alpha in this case is 1. Okay, because if, if this are raised to a alpha f power, then the formula contains gamma alpha minus d by 2 over gamma alpha. And mr squared has the power. Yes, mr squared will have a power. So mr squared. d by 2 minus 1. 3 for d by 2 minus 1. See, this you can easily read out from here, right? Because you just scale L, right? L and M has the same dimension, right? Just by dimension analysis, you can figure out. There's an M to the power d, and there's a 1 over M squared, right? Sorry, okay. So that means M to the power d minus 2. Right, which is mr square to the power d by 2 minus 1. Is this clear? Yeah. Right, this also follows from the formula. I mean, the formula that I gave, right, I first scaled out the factor of that, I call this c, right, a is square plus 3, and there is this power of c that was scaled out. That power of c is this mr square to the power d by 2 minus 1. So let's evaluate this form a little more, or maybe I write it here. Minus i times x tilde phi minus 1 q1 square plus m square z tilde phi minus 1 m r square. <coughs> minus i lambda r by 2 due to the power epsilon. Let's put that mr to the power d by 2 minus 1, right? So that's 4 minus epsilon by 2 minus 1. And then 1 over 4 pi 
to the power d by 2, that's 4 minus epsilon by 2. And here in gamma, 1 minus d by 2, so 1 minus 4 minus epsilon by 2, divided by gamma of 1. So this would be finite. So that is finite. Now we can simplify this a little more. This one, gamma of one is how much? One. Right? In the numerator, you have gamma of minus one plus epsilon by two. So yeah, the epsilon goes to zero, you expect this to have a pole. Because gamma function has pole on the all, all negative integer. Right? But to determine this pole, you can write this as gamma of epsilon by two divided by minus one plus epsilon. Gamma of x is x minus one times gamma of x minus one. That's familiar. Gamma of x is x minus one gamma of x minus 1. This is the reason why gamma, gamma for an integer becomes factorial. So that's what I have used. Gamma of epsilon by 2 is epsilon by 2 minus 1 times gamma of epsilon by 2 minus 1. Right? So this is this ratio is the same as this. Right? Gamma of epsilon by 2 is epsilon by 2 minus 1 times gamma of epsilon by 2 minus 1 and that are explicitly divided by epsilon by 2 minus 1. But gamma of x, how does it behave as x goes to 0? 1 by x plus Euler number plus. Yeah, it's 1 by x plus some finite quantity, right? That is familiar. Gamma of x as x goes to 0 is 1 over x plus some finite quantity. So this goes as then 2 by epsilon. There's a minus 1 sitting here as epsilon goes to 0. So this quantity then is minus 2 over epsilon plus finite. Pardon? The numerator. So denominator I have already taken. The numerator is just 2 over epsilon plus finite, right? And the denominator goes to minus 1. Okay? That's why it is minus 7. Is this okay? So then this is minus i times x tilde phi minus 1 t1 square plus zm square z tilde phi minus 1 m r square minus i lambda r minus 2 mu to the epsilon. In fact, I can write this now as mu over m r. See, this is where you will see that why introducing this mu is useful. Mu over m r to the power epsilon. Yeah, mu, see, m r to the power minus epsilon by 2, right? So, so m r square to the power minus epsilon by 2, that's m r to the minus epsilon. So when you expand this out, this, this basically becomes this times m r square. times this one I can take 1 over 4 pi as epsilon goes to 0 this has become 4 pi whole square that's 16 pi square 1 over 16 pi square times minus 2 over epsilon plus pi Right, I just put everything together, right? Here, see, the, there is a pole which is of the form 2 over epsilon, right? If we want to extract the infinite, the divergent piece, right? Then everything else you can expand out, the expanding Taylor series, and pick only the constant piece, right? So here, 
there will be an epsilon dependent. Right? There will be 16 pi square, and then there are 4 pi to the power minus epsilon by 2. Right? But 4 pi to the minus epsilon by 2, as epsilon goes to 0, it starts its expansion at 1. See, the way to expand it, if, if we have c to the power epsilon, right? you can write it e to the power epsilon log c. c to the power epsilon is e to the epsilon log c, right? which you can then exp expand in general series expansion. Right? 1 plus epsilon log c plus epsilon square log c whole square divided by 2 and so on. And for in this case, for picking up the divergent piece, it's just enough to look at the constant piece. Right? If there is 1 over epsilon square, then to pick up the divergent piece, you have to need, you have to keep up to first order in epsilon. Okay? In two loops, in fact, you will encounter such situations. Okay? But at one loop, the divergent piece is 1 over epsilon. Everything else, okay, you can't, you just pick up the constant piece. That means you take epsilon goes to zero limit in all the other quantities. That multiplies it. Okay? If you are interested in picking up the infinite piece. Okay? And that's what we see here. That's what we have done. I have already taken the epsilon goes to zero limit in all of these quantities. Well, here I have not done, okay, this is, I have not done it, just to illustrate something that is useful. Again, it's not relevant for one loop, okay? but you see that by having this mu, okay, we have explicitly matched the dimensions on both sides, okay, because there is a mu over mr to the epsilon. Of course, in the epsilon goes to zero limit, it just goes to one anyway. But even for finite epsilon, the dimensions match on both sides. So without the mu, there will be, well, there will be apparent loss of dimension matching because lambda will be dimension four. Okay, here, it's clear the lambda is dimensionless and the dimensions match because this is dimension of mass square, this is dimension of mass square, this is dimension of mass square, and this is a ratio of mass, so no dimensionless, right? Whatever be the value of epsilon, this is dimension. Is this okay? So now we are more or less there. Mm -hmm. One more step I have to write. That square bracket closes after a mass square. The second the square bracket. Yes. Yeah. So it matters, of course. You have to adjust this to cancel this. Yeah, yeah, for any sign you could do this. Yeah, whatever the, this sign is, that will determine what the signs of these are. Then you will adjust this to cancel that. Then, but if the sign matters in the sense that it tells you the sign of the renormalization. Yeah, and later on, we will see that this uh, has some significance. But right now, we are just adjusting this to, I mean, whatever be the sign, you have to co uh, correspondingly adjust the sign of the things. So let's just simplify this a little bit more. So you have minus i, z tilde of i minus 1, mu 1 square plus z m square z tilde of i minus 1, mu 1 square. Okay, so here minus i and then my, the two minus signs, so that becomes plus. This two cancels this two. So plus i lambda r over 16 pi square epsilon mr square plus i. Okay, I now also set epsilon equal to 0 here. Okay, mu over mr to the epsilon, but I can, this I can write in e to the power epsilon log mu over r, right, and expand it out in parts of epsilon, but we just need to pick the leading part, which is 1. Okay. Any constant a to the power 0 is 1, right? That's what we are using here. So 
the constant to the power epsilon, I am taking the epsilon goes to 0. Is this okay? So now we are in a position to determine this constant. So what should we choose for the tilde phi? To order lambda. One, right? Because there is a divergent piece proportional to P1 squared. Okay, so the tilde phi I can choose to be one at this order. What about the m square the tilde phi? One plus lambda r. One plus lambda r. Or 16 pi square epsilon. Yeah. Okay. So using the fact that the tilde phi is one, I can write the m square is one plus lambda r over 16 pi square epsilon. And this tells us that ZM is 1 plus lambda r by 32 pi squares. So you are not worried about order lambda r square terms anyway. Okay, because those you have not determined, but that you have to actually do a full calculation. So to this order, I just click ZM equal to 1 plus lambda r over 32 pi square epsilon. Yes, we can. In fact, that we can have it right here also. So let me write on the more general choice. So more general choice would have been the tilde phi is one plus some c phi times lambda i, and the m as one plus c m lambda i plus. Okay, by C of C phi and C m are finite. C phi C m finite. Any finite constant you could have chosen. Right? Because adding a finite constant to the tilde phi will not make any difference, right? You just get a given C on C phi times P on square, which is a finite of the term anyway. Right? So similarly here, if I Add a finite constant to Zm and keep only terms up to order lambda r right, in this expansion. Again, you can see that we just add a finite piece over here. Okay. It doesn't affect the divergence. Okay. So these kinds of changes are allowed. Okay. And this is what one you know, normally uh, means by renormalization scheme. Okay. That you always have a possibility of adding finite constants to these renormalized renormalization parameters. Okay. But these finite constants are just redefinition of fields. Right? For example, what does this mean? A tilde phi equal to 1 versus a tilde phi equal to c phi lambda r. Right? What is the difference between these two? So you recall that the difference between these two is I mean, what are the where did z tilde phi appear? Right? Phi is equal to z tilde phi to the half times phi r. Right? So if you change z tilde phi from 1 to another finite constant, that basically means that you are <coughs> multiplying that phi r by another finite constant. Right? I could have absorbed the constant inside phi, phi r, and call this our new phi r. So it's clear from this that these constants can be changed by just a redefinition of phi r. Okay, instead of using, let me write. Yeah. So similarly, there will be a redefinition of lambda. Uh, we'll, we'll discuss the relation of lambda. I have not determined z lambda yet, right? That we cannot determine from this calculation. You have to do another calculation to determine z lambda. Right? But right now we are just looking at z tilde phi and z m. Okay, both of which have been determined from this thing. So what? Uh, 
What I'm saying is that if we have the relation that phi is the tilde phi times phi r, okay? and if we multiply, if we change phi r to 1 plus some c phi lambda r times phi r, okay? what you are calling phi r earlier, suppose I call that equal to this. This is just a change of the definition of what I am calling phi r, right? So this cannot change the physics. But this will change z tilde phi, because effectively now the new z tilde phi will be z tilde phi times 1 plus c phi lambda r. Right? And that's exactly the kind of change we have here. Okay? From z tilde phi equal to 1, we want to z tilde phi equal to 1 plus c phi lambda r. Is this clear? So this is just a redefinition of the normalized fields. Right? Instead of calling phi r as a renormalized field, you call phi r times something as a renormalized field. But at the end, it makes no difference. Similarly, we have this relation that m is z m times phi r, right? How do we define m? Yes, m is equal to z m times m. Suppose what I am calling MR, now I call 1 plus CM times CM lambda R times MR. That is just a redefinition of the parameter. Earlier, <coughs> as using a parameter MR, now I am calling the same parameter as 1 plus CM lambda R times MR. So, it will not change any physics. Nevertheless, it will change the definition of Zm now. Right? Because Zm gets multiplied by its 1 plus Cm lambda. And to the order that we are working here, that just means that it will add to Zm a term that is proportional to Cm lambda. So this is the reason why the renormalization constants, okay, these finite renormalizations are arbitrary, but at the end, it doesn't change the physics. Yes, exactly. Yeah, because different observables will be expressed in terms of MR, lambda, R, etc. Right? So if you have made a change of def definition of the MRs, right? effectively different observables will be now different functions of MRs and lambdas. Right? But the relationship between the observables will not change. Right? Each observable will be a different function of MR and lambda, right? because that definition has changed. But the physical observables will have the same relation. This, yeah. See, this is also the reason I said that the MRs and lambdas are not physical parameters. Okay. Because those can be changed depending on what you choose as a renormalization constant. Okay. Different choice of renormalization constants will mean that you are effectively redefining your MRs and lambdas, okay, which are not physical. See, DuPont function, the leading term had a i over p1 square plus m, m r square, right? Now, this will give you a p1 square times two factors of p1 square, p1, p1 square plus m r square in the numerator. Right? So those terms you have factored out. If you remember the two external propagators we factored out, right? So, its DuPont function is not just this, but this multiplied by 1 over p1 square plus m r square whole square. Is this so then, of course, you can try to resum, but that we are not trying to worry about that right now. Okay, if you are looking for poles, then sometimes you may have to try to resum this diagrams. But at this stage, you are not worried about looking for poles. We are just trying to make things finite at one level. Right? So this then makes the two point function finite, right? But of course, there are infinite number of functions even at one loop, right? You can draw infinite number of diagrams, right? You have to somehow make all of them finite, right? 
right? So how do you make all of them pi? Right? So let's try to go to the next diagram. That's a four-part function. Four-part function, first of all, of course, has this, this connection diagram, which you will not worry about. This is finite anyway, right? It has this. This is also finite, right? There is no loop involved anywhere. Then there are diagrams with loops. Some of them are easy to like these ones, a loop inserted on the external line. Okay, this is divergent. D four a over a square. Right, this is the that's the structure it has. But it should be clear that this cancels this. This was designed to cancel this essentially, right? The rest of the diagrams are the same. So these two just cancel, right? So you don't have to really worry about these diagrams. Similarly, there are similar insertions on this, this, and this. This can also be inserted on this, this, and this. Those all cancel. Okay? So this is finite. Okay? So you don't have to worry. These are all finite. Okay? So let's worry about the really divergent diagrams. And those are these. Level one, two, three, four, one, three, two, four, and one, four, two, three. Okay, so let me just label this, I think that will become a key. Yeah, so Q1, P2, P3, P4. Okay, similarly Q1, P3, P2, P4, and so on. So these are all potentially divergent, right? Because there, are, there is a D4L and then there are two propagators. L square coming from here, L square coming from here. Is there any other diagram you have to include? The counter term diagram, right? That's this one. Okay, that's the diagram that comes from z lambda z phi, z lambda z tilde phi square minus one times lambda. Okay. This is this is of the same order as this, right? Because this has two factors of lambda, right? That's lambda r square. Okay. This already has an overall factor of lambda, but then there is z lambda z phi square minus one, which can be of order lambda, right? So this is also of order lambda r square. And so you have to adjust this z lambda. See, z, z tilde phi you have already fixed, right? We cannot do much about that, but z lambda is up to us. Okay. So we have to adjust z lambda to cancel off this argument. Right? That's the uh, basic philosophy. Right? That's the way we will make this finite. Sir, we may have to include also this diagram that the three and two process. Yes, you have to. Like this. Yeah, but you, you know what you have to cancel against, right? No, no, no. Yeah, okay. Okay, okay. That will cancel the two cross part. Yeah. Okay. Right? So once you have cancelled these, Right? Whenever you encounter this, you also put the cross. Right? They will add up to Q0. Right? So that's why you don't have to worry about these anymore. Okay? So the technically, one says that one has to basically worry about what is what are called one particle irreducible diagrams. Right? The diagrams where by cutting a line, single line, you cannot divide it into two parts. Okay? Because as long as you have made the sub diagrams finite, the full diagram is finite anyway. Okay? Like here. By cutting this, you can divide it into two parts, right? 
So as long as individual parts have been made finite already, okay, the whole thing is finite. So in fact, here there are, uh, you have to add up four different configurations to make it finite. Like this, this, and you also have this, this. Okay, then it, it's clear in the factors. Okay, because you have this plus this, see, it, it, this will cancel this basically, right? Because this is common, and these two just add up to zero. Okay. Similarly, between these, this is common, and these two add up to zero. Right? So you have to add these four diagrams to make the whole thing diagram. Okay, so let's look at one of these diagrams, one of these. Okay, this time I'm not going to evaluate it very explicitly, but I'll just tell you how to do this. If you label the momentum, okay, it's like if this is L, this will be minus P1, minus P2, minus L. So you get integral dDL, I'm just writing the loop integral point. And then minus i over L square plus MR square and then minus i over Q1 plus Q2 plus L plus MR square. Okay, I'm not writing the external propagator yet, right? Just a divergent piece. Because you see external propagators, the momentum conserving delta function are all common between this diagram and these diagrams. Okay, so you don't have to worry about those. So this is what you have to evaluate. Okay, in eventually you want to take the d goes to four limit. Now if you want to evaluate it exactly, then you have to do what I did last time, that you have to combine these using Feynman parametrization, right? You introduce the x1 and x2, combine them into a single denominator, and then evaluate the integral. But if you are only interested in evaluating its divergent piece, then you can use a shortcut. You can use a shortcut because you see that this diagram, okay, the divergence comes, comes from large L region, right? And in large L region, it's logarithmical divergence. Right? So, its divergent piece, let me write it, so you can show that its divergent piece can be written in this following way. What did you do? Okay, this factor is exactly as it is. In this factor, I just drop the p1 plus p2. Why can you do that? You can do that because you can calculate the difference between these two. Okay, take a difference between these two. And you will find that the difference between these two goes as 1 over L cube, not 1 over L square. Okay, because the 1 over L square piece is the same between these and this. Okay, so when you calculate the difference, it goes as 1 over L cube for large L. And that, of course, is a finite integral, right? Where there's L square here, and there's a one for L cube coming from here. Is that point clear? See, it's like one over A minus one over B, right? So in the numerator, you get A times B. In the numerator, A minus B. Right? A times B gives you two plus two, four powers. Right? Two powers of L from here, two powers of L from there. A minus B, they are going to take a defined group of this and this, the quadratic piece just drops out. Quadratic piece, L square piece just cancels, right? So it's linear in L. So one power of L in the numerator, four parts in the denominator. Okay, so that's like one over L cube. Okay, and that's why the difference is finite. So this is equal to this plus finite. Okay, and this integral, of course, is easy to evaluate, right? If there's alpha equal to two version of what I 
did earlier. It's like L square plus M square to the power alpha. Yes. No, you cannot always put. If it is a quadratic divergent, for example, right? Then the difference may still be the order maker divergent. Right? Then you have to worry. Right? In this case, that's not a problem because it's already it, to begin with it is logarithmic maker divergent. Right? So if you set the external momentum to zero, the error that we'll be making is finite. Right? You have to make sure that the difference between the integral that you are actually evaluating and the integral they are supposed to evaluate, right? that difference should be finite. Right? And in this case, you can argue that that is finite. So you can evaluate this. Right? In fact, you can not only evaluate this, you can also see that this argument tells us that all of these three diagrams have exactly the same divergence. Right? Because it's not sensitive to the external momentum. Right? What is the difference between this diagram and this diagram? That P1 plus P2 will be replaced by P1 plus P3. Right? And it will be it will be replaced by P1 plus P4. Right? But the divergent piece is totally insensitive to all of that. Yes, of course, if this into a combinatorial factor, and then you have to multiply the whole thing by three at the end, because there are three diagrams. So now, I'm going to write down the final result for this. Exercise. There can be finite directions. Okay, and since z tilde of i, we already determined is 1 plus finite. This tells us that z lambda 1 plus. But we have a choice of adding C lambda times lambda R. Well, this is a finite policy. Okay, this is again the Yamalson ambiguity. That it doesn't determine the finiteness of the amplitudes, not fix the finite part of the Yamalson constants. Okay, but that's just the definition of the coupling. But there is a 1 over L square also, right? This is common anyway. So it becomes 1 over L to the 5. Right? That's why it becomes finite. So you should try dd. So this becomes finite as d goes to 4. Right? So this shows that then if you are interested in just picking up the 1 over epsilon contribution, then the difference doesn't contribute to that. Sir? Yes. Uh, uh, in the z lambda, the finite piece, what you have written, that is also proportional to lambda r. In z lambda, yes. In z lambda? Yes. So, uh, that will make really problem if uh, that change the sign means adding the c lambda with the no, but in lambda r you are adding with lambda r square see lambda r is z lambda times lambda r right okay so the change the requirement okay, the okay, okay, definition okay. that you are doing okay, okay right is lambda r goes to lambda r plus some okay. lambda r square okay. see you don't want to change things to lowest order right yeah lowest order you always do it in part of it so the connection is always one or a time. Yeah, yeah. Is this okay? What about all?
all the other diagrams are the other divergences you have to worry about at one loop. So let me scratch. Well, in this case, in fact, we have basically removed all divergences, right? So it's not hard to see. At one loop, if you want to do higher quant function, it's a six quant function. This is a six point function. This, of course, is three level, right? This is the leading order. Okay, so no divergence there. To add loops, right? What can you do? You can do this. Right? But this is, we know how to get rid of this, right? This will combine with the corresponding thing with a loss. Okay, so these two cancel. Is that clear? If you add a loop here, you put a cross here. Right? Again, those cancel. So these are not problematic. Okay, all of these kinds cancel anyway. So you have to worry about again what I mentioned as one particle irreducible divergences which are not already of the kind that you have cancelled, like this one. This diagram. If it was divergent, we have not done something that already cancels it. Right? There's no see the in phi four theory, if this diagram has turned out to be divergent, then there is a problem because we don't have already a phi to the six coupling which can, we can normalize, right? The like the action doesn't contain a phi to the six coupling, right? So there is no z for the phi to the six coupling. So there is no counter term of this kind, okay, which you could use to cancel this. Fortunately, this is not divergent. Okay, there is a d4l and there is l square, l square, l square. Okay, three parts of l square in the numerator, so that's like l to the six. So this is finite. So you don't have to worry about divergences from here. And you can easily convince yourself that every other diagram that you can draw in phi four theory at one loop are finite. Are either finite or if they have divergences, they are of the kind that you have already cancelled, right? Those divergences are sub-divergences. Divergences of a sub-diagram, which you have already cancelled by adding counter terms, right? So you can do it again as part of the sub-diagram, like these ones. These ones means that this can be cancelled by adding a cross here. This is cancelled by adding a cross here, and so on. So phi four at one loop is normalizable, right? That's what you have checked because you have cancelled explicitly the divergences that are present, and we can see explicitly that no other divergence is present. We'll, we'll try to develop a more abstract formalism, but I mean, eventually that will also boil down to power counting. You just count how many parts are there in the numerator and denominator, and you have to verify that there are more parts in the denominator than in the numerator. Okay, to show that it's finite. Is this clear? So this is an example of a renormalizable theory. Five to the four. At least one loop renormalizable theory. You don't have to worry about it. Now, what about a, an example of a non-renormalizable theory? Right. Let me just um, describe one and then we'll finish. So, what is an example of a non-renormalizable theory? Five to the six in four dimension is a non-renormalizable theory. Okay. So let's see why. Suppose you also add a phi to the six vortex, right? Beta phi to the six vortex. Okay, 
Suppose I add a beta pi to the fix turning the action. And we'll do as before. Okay, I'll write beta as z beta times beta r and pi as z tilde pi to the power half times pi r. To rewrite this as integral beta r pi r to the fixed dx plus z <coughs> tilde pi cube z beta minus 1. We again divide beta into the normalized part and the original. The original beta, we just write as the product of beta r and z beta. And the idea is that if there is a divergence, you have to write as z beta to cancel that. Is it clear? Yes? Exactly what we did for 5, 4, we are doing it for 5, 6. So now, this diagram, of course, is not divergent. Okay, where you are using the 5, 4 points. But there are examples of divergent terms like this. So this is a lambda, this is a beta. This is divergent. Two propagators, right? The D4L over L square whole square. Right, this is divergent. But this you don't worry, right? Because what will you what will you adjust to cancel this divergence? Yes? See, this is six point function, right? This will get a contribution from this counter term. Right? This is this z tilde of i cube z beta minus one. Okay, so this divergence is present now. Okay, in the mm -hmm. six point coupling, but you don't worry about this because you can adjust your z beta to cancel of this divergence. But now you see that this diagram beta r here and beta r here. This is also divergent. D4L over L square whole square, right? Two propagators that gives you four parts in the numerator, in the denominator. This is divergent, right? How do you cancel this? Yes. Only one phi six vertex is not going to help. One phi six vertex is not going to help, right? Because that, that is used to cancel this term. Yeah, so the only way you can cancel this possibly is by using a phi 8 counter term. Phi to the 8 counter term would have cancelled this, but there is no phi to the 8 counter term, right? There is no phi to the 8 vertex. See, so counter terms come only if you take the original parameter and rewrite in terms of the new parameter, right? If we haven't put the phi to the 8 coupling to begin with, you cannot use it to cancel this, right? So you can say, okay, why don't, why don't we try to add a phi to the 8 vertex? Right? Maybe that will cancel it, right? Then you can use a zero and cancel it. Okay. The problem is that now phi to the zero will become divergent. Okay, so you cannot stop this process. Okay, now if you try to add more, you have to basically keep on adding more and more vertices, right? So you'll find that theory eventually has infinite number of parameters. That's right? so everything is unrelated to everything else, right? So you cannot do very much with this theory. Okay. So because of this. There's a clear distinction between phi to the four theories and phi to the six theory. Okay, in four dimension, phi to the four is normalizable, but phi to the six is not. Okay. So we'll see later that how to dis distinguish between which theory is normalizable and which are not. Okay. There's a systematic procedure by which you can determine 
when a given theory, if somebody gives a Lagrangian, right, you can determine when the Lagrangian gives a renormalizable theory. Okay, but this is the main distinction. Okay, renormalizable theories can be made finite by adjusting only a finite set of renormalization constants. The non-renormalizable theories okay, cannot be made finite by adjusting a finite set of parameters. Okay. If you want to make them finite, you have to introduce infinite number of parameters. Right, which basically means that the theory really has no uh, prediction. Right, because you have infinite number of quantities expressed as a function of infinite number of parameters. Right, so you can get any value that you like. Sir, in this example, where did we use the fact that we are four dimensions? Oh, the degree of divergence. Right, five to the six. Suppose you are working up in three dimensions. In three dimensions, no, five to the six. In two dimensions, I think you have to go all the way down to two dimensions. Okay. In two dimensions, these diagrams, uh, these diagrams are finite, right? Okay. In three dimensions, also it is okay. I think three dimension, no, three dimension is okay. Yeah, I think in three dimension also it should be okay. And check in 3x. If you are reducing the dimension, dimension of 5 is half. Only greater than means if you take 6 vertex, then you have to go to 6 dimension. No, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> in the other way. Oh. See, the total dimension of the. Terms should be less than three. If you are in three dimensions, then you should be right. Five cube in six dimensions is normal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So I think five six in three dimension is okay because if we use three dimensional thing, right? The five has mass dimension half, right? So five six will have mass dimension three. Okay. So three dimensions should be okay. Yeah, so this will be like d cube k and they will be k4. This is k4, right? So then it will be k squared by k4. Yeah, so this is finite. So this is finite. There's no problem now, right? No, no. It's d cube k over k square whole square, right? So d k over k square. That's the kind of integral you are getting. Right? So if you want to go to 5, 6, right, in 3 dimensions, you are okay. Well, no, no. But the point is, you, you cannot go to lower dimensions, right? You have to ultimately come back to 4 dimensions. So if you want to write down theories, right, for the just quantum field theories for fun, yes, then if you want to have a 5, 6 theory, you have to go to lower dimensions. Right? But if you want to work in 4 dimensions, Right? Then you have to restrict to Lagrangian, the kind of Lagrangian you are working with. Right? That you, I mean, for a scalar field, you can go up to 5 4 interaction, but not beyond. Pardon? No, that, that is not normal. Then you have to put an explicit cutoff. Right? That has its own problem. But, so you will not consider purely with explicit cutoff. If we think of a field theory as a fundamental theory, then you cannot really go beyond the five four interaction. Sir, uh, that will be five cube interaction. Yes, that is a five cube interaction. Okay. In this case, okay, we'll discuss the role of symmetries. The point is that a five four theory. If you have m square five square plus five to the four, right, then there is symmetry. Five goes to minus five. Okay. So when you try to write down a renormalizable Lagrangian, you have a choice of restricting operators which are invariant on certain symmetries. Okay? You can restrict to certain, you can choose that you will want to maintain phi goes to minus phi symmetry. Okay? And you can say that we will only consider theories where phi goes to minus phi uh, is a symmetry. Right? And then you can eliminate the phi cube term. But if you want to work in the phi 4 theory, okay? and if you want to eliminate the mass term, that is difficult. That is difficult because if you want to set m square equal to 0 from the beginning, okay, 
you see that we have to deal with these terms, right? This came from ZM. Yeah. So if you didn't have the M to begin with as a parameter, right? There will be no ZM. Right? Then you cannot cancel these terms. Right? So while in FIPO theory you cannot introduce operators of higher dimension, right? it also says that you have to keep the operators of lower dimension. Right? Like if you are including a phi q phi four vortex, right? you should also include a phi square vortex. Okay, without the phi square term, if you had set the phi square equal to zero from the beginning, then it will be hard to cancel this dimension. Is this clear? So we'll discuss the general property of a normalizable theory and then probably it will become clearer. But this is just an example that we need certain number of vertices because we want the corresponding counter terms to cancel divergences. But at the same time, we cannot put too many vertices because then we generate new divergences whose count terms are simply not present. Okay. So it's a fine balance between how many operators you have to include at what you cannot include. Right? You cannot use less or more. Okay. Like here, you cannot use less because if you, if you drop the phi square term, then you cannot cancel this divergence. Okay. And you cannot use more because if you use a phi to the sixth term, okay. then you generate more and more divergences which you cannot cancel. 